Well, my name is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Ethan Orr from the Cooperative Extension. I actually wear many hats for our university. One of them that will play into my next presentation somewhat, in addition to the research side and the administration side, I've also uh, taken over and I'm, I'm uh, kind of writing the ship on our Natural Users Law and Policy Center. So I'll be talking a little bit about how that um, pertains to a number of other things as well. Thank you. Moving very quickly because I want to keep us on schedule, I'm going to talk about our irrigation program, some of the other things, and then really get into what we're seeing um, overall in our state in terms of soil research and investment. I mentioned this with the last panel that I was hosting, but I always want to start with this because I start with the optimism of us as Arizonans. We can and we will do better with resources. And as many of us who work directly with growers know, water is an input. And the cost of water imp impacts the cost of everything else. And it's really a business function as much as anything else. But what we've seen, and when we start talking about externalities and investment, one of the biggest things that we can do as a state and we can do as a research institution is sort of take that first initial risk. You know, Shane mentioned the, the uh, sense of place research and our experiment stations. The first tractor in Arizona, it depends on who you talk to, if it was in Tucson or Safford, but it was really done on our uh, experiment stations. And so there's a lot of initial investments and a lot of initial ideas that we can, as a society, take the hit on and help our farmers grow. And the results are this. I won't show this slide because um, we're a little bit short on time, but if you look at the economic growth of the United States, it's actually kind of a miracle. Economists call this future preference, where one in, uh, generation invests in the next. And you would think it would be linear increase. It's actually parabolic increase with two major inflection points. The first is when, uh, after the Morrell Act, after we created a land grant institution and we invested heavily in ourselves and our infrastructure. The second was actually after President Eisenhower, which is really, I think, the, uh, the, the, the heir, the child of the land grant concept, the GI Bill, the community college in it. One resulted in the Industrial Revolution, one in the Technological Revolution. So every time we've invested in ourselves, as a people, as a state, it's shown great results. So to talk about a program that we just started, um, actually in February, uh, and this is, I really want to thank my colleagues who are in the room that help work with me on this, Dia, DeBunker, and Robert, among other uh, extension scientists. We do all this together, and I'm going to talk through our irrigation efficiency program. It was started with $30 million in ARPA funding in February, originally Governor Ducey and then Governor Hobbs. And we did such a good job with it. Uh, we had uh, about 42% private sector match that last year the legislature funded 15.2 million that we have not started spending. So the, the results I'm gonna show you are on that first 30 million. And this upcoming session, uh, Representative Dunn has actually dropped the bill to fund an additional 25 million. And Representative Griffin has, has matched that between an additional 25 to 50 million. And the, res the reason for that is basically the applied science and that partnership that Extension has created with industry. So this is the first tranche of money, and, and in that first 30 million, we've set aside $2 million for soil and irrigation research that we've been doing on the farm and really combining that. One thing I'm gonna talk about a little bit later as well, we circulated, and DeBunker was really the author of it, a white paper at our state legislature for another $2 million, because the way that I see this as an administrator, uh, and Chana sort of mentioned it, you know, a lot of our research trials are one-offs. Someone, will, I'll go to Robert, and I have a new company, and it's, it's gonna solve all your problems. Here's $5,000 to do a field trial in this situation with this crop one season. And, and we push them out for five, but there's nothing comprehensive. So the way that we do like cotton variety trials, and you know this in agriculture, the crop that you pick is about the most important decision you're gonna make. And we all have different soil, we all have different climates, and so we do cotton variety trials across the state to help you get that. Soil amendments are much more complicated, and so what I'd like to see is something along those lines where I have a comprehensive, akin to a cotton variety trial, research in terms of soil amendments, because it's not a soil amendment, it's a soil amendment with this crop, with this soil, with this climate. And, and what ends up happening is the people that are the most aggressive, and I'm seeing this with our irrigation vendors as well, they are well-funded to sell things. And I, I, our first panel talked about it. They will, answer, they, will, they will answer everything in the affirmative. I've talked to them like, well, I need a 20% water efficiency. I can do that. 
Well, I need to increase, improve crop productivity. I do that too. And, and it becomes this miracle snake oil. But the truth is, soil amendments are important. And in many areas, like the Mesa, they're essential and can do a lot. But it's figuring out what is that function that we need that am amendment to do, again, pertaining to that soil and that crop and that climate. So from this first initiation, um, going back to our irrigation, we funded uh, 62 programs. And I'm going to show the results of this. Uh, this was the first tranche of money. We haven't touched the 15 million. The private sector, because I can fund up to 1,500 an acre and anything over, so a center pivot's going to cost me anywhere from 2,500 an acre to 4,000, depending on, on the configuration of that pivot, the growers put that in. So that 16 million has come from the farmers themselves. And the results of that are this right here. Half of our programs have been here in the Yuma area, but the numbers that I'm really particularly proud of is we as a collective, as growers and as academia working together, have converted over 18,000 of flood irrigation. And flood is not a bad word, nor should it be, because we have to do something to germinate. We have to do something to push that, soil, that salt down. But we've converted 18,000 acres to something else. That's micro sprinklers, drip, uh, center pivot system. And the annual water savings of that is just over 36,000 water acre feet. Now, Senator Fernandez says our friends at our city are talking in terms of gallons. I'm actually learning to talk in terms of lakes. Everyone here in this knows how much a water acre foot is. It's a lot. I talk in terms of Tempe Town Lakes, which is about 3,000 water acre feet. We, out here in the hinterlands, have conserved over 12 times the size of Tempe Town Lake every year by increased efficiency and our crop yields are maintaining or increasing. With cotton, we've actually seen one season increased crop yields, which is very exciting. We're doing a number of tests in terms of the soil health, which I, that's still out because we're only a year into this. But I'm very optimistic, particularly with cotton, on our crop yields. The other thing that's so exciting about this is our cost per water acre foot. And, and that was also mentioned, but there's nothing like um, success to beget other success. This is the 620 feet per, per acre foot is about a fifth of any augmentation if I did desalinization out of the Sea of Cortez or if I did any sort of our urban conservation solutions, it's less than a fifth of that. Now the reason of that is one, ag is already extremely efficient, but they're also highly innovated, and it's the Pareto principle. Ag uses 70 to 75 percent of the water in the state, so if you're going to invest in ag, you're going to see the largest gains by creating efficiencies within your ag system. And so the benefit of this also for the farmers, we've created stackable programs. It's not just our money but we partner with NRCS, we partner with other programs that I can bring as an economic development person, multiple programs to bear on a single field. And then the most important thing from an academic standpoint becomes we engender in a relationship. And that relationship allows us to create technical advice, labor advice, and other on-farm solutions that are beyond just what we have here. The other thing, and this is, this is the biggest thing that I push because I do not like this divisive language that has been introduced really by Phoenix, which many cases is growth predicated on growth. No offense to my Phoenix friends, as I say divisive language. I'm sorry, I grew up in Tucson. I have to shake my fist sometimes. But the problem is because of political dynamics, and I really have to say this, if you look at what happened just north of Scottsdale with some of the communities not having it, it was not a water issue. I want to reemphasize it was not a water issue where some of the homes did not receive water. It was a political, in this case, a municipal political issue that went unresolved because we weren't able to provide academic research technical solutions. And so what's happening here in our diet and our discourse is political divisiveness for gain, particularly in this case by the home builders. Now the problem with home, for those of us in ag, there's nothing wrong with building homes. Like we need more homes, but home building becomes a very permanent solution. I can grow alfalfa, make a mistake, and then replant the next season. The instant I convert anything to homes, it, it will stay that. And that configuration, particularly if you don't do your design standards with your IPM and your retention basins and your water harvesting correct, you have that forever. What you build, you own. And so that's what the problem with a lot of conversion to homes is. It's a permanent change to that land. But the other thing that becomes important, and I, the reason I don't like this land, or this the divisiveness, 
in terms of livability, this state needs agriculture. They need it to address the externalities. So Tucson and Phoenix, and we're trying to do this with some of our urban ag problems, really have a serious heat island problem. And so ag on the hinterlands really mitigates the heat island effects, but also if you look at Pinal County, we have a series of PM10 dust issues. And so the ability of, of uh, agriculture to resolve the PM10, the haboobs, along I-10 where I have 110, 112,000 people every day, really makes a selling point for investing and sticking together on this. Some other things that we've looked at very quickly, um, telemetry. Uh, those in ag will know that. It's basically just watering at the right time based on the data. We're also irrigating farm workers. I'm working with WIFA, our, our water finance infrastructure, on the uh, on basically the conveyance side, and I'm hurrying this up to get to questions, and then the soil health and irrigation resource. Uh, this is where our, our field stations are, and I'm actually trying to grow that out so that we can include snowpack, snowmelt in our projections, but this is one of the, the programs that kind of rolls up to me in this, and this data really is the backbone, not only for our planting decisions, but also for a lot of our environmental resource research. And as you can see, there's a lot in Yuma, but this speaks to Water savings, not just through transitioning from big system to big system and big changes, but really all like if you're creating a habit, it's the thousand little things you do that become a big thing. And this weather data, the soil sensors, allow us to really speak to that and make these micro on-farm changes that I think largely can generate more water savings than changing the system. These are some other programs, uh, and, and Ralph already talked about it, so I'm gonna fly through, but if you, the deadlines on, or the deadlines on this is February 2nd. And so if, uh, if you are interested as a grower in any of these programs, please see me after this. The last thing I wanna talk to is workforce. Um, this is something that is both, it, it's a double-edged sword, it's positive. You know, and this is Richard Florida's work, but if you look in the early 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, 90 to 70% to 90 of us were involved in the production of food. Now it's less than two. What's incredible about that is that frees the other 88% of us to do something else, but it also, and this was alluded to, there's issues of storytelling. And so, you know, how do we convey that story? And more importantly, how do we train the next generation of workforce? You know, really, farmers haven't done this because we've always had crop rotation, but if you look at the academic li literature, we've gone from after post-World War II, high, in, high input, high output, to much more regenerative ag, restoration of the soil, and, and really a lot of PhD level thinkings at very small farms, which is quite impressive. But one of the ways, so I built our, and this is the number of farms, I built our agriculture workforce program, and we we're actually working with Robert to get a number of farms. We have apprentices, we need farms here in Yuma, and we really want to work with you on this. But what we're doing, this is two million from the state legislature, um, and we've been very successful, but the thing that I've embraced, and I'm trying to do this with all of our workforce, it's not replacing job with job, but it's replacing, through applied technology, job with someone that can do the job of three people beforehand. And so, um, for example, we have ranchers that are using drone technology and geofencing to herd the cattle. So there's a series of things that we're doing, and that's why broadband is so important here in Yuma, because we can't do precision ag without broadband. It's been actually one of our most limiting factors. I've gotten the hook, and so I have time for two questions or so if people have any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is, um, like me as, as an irrigator, I want to be as effective as I can be to conserve water, for, to not use that much uh, resources. Mm -hmm. So my goal is to, is to be the more educated as possible. And like for an example, if I can, is there a way I can get, if I'm working as a, a, a support man irrigator, is there a way I can get in contact with you guys like uh, to ask you, like we have this, this, uh, we need to irrigate this, but we use this amount of water. Do you think you have something better? Do you think we have, I can, can I get in contact with your agent? With, with I, I absolutely, in fact, he raised his hand, Robert, and uh, his technician, Hector, 
who we, we were fortunate enough to hire, was a professional irrigator. And a couple things that we want to do with this program is to elevate the training. Because if you have an educated irrigator workforce, we'll save more water. But you, sir, and you understand this, and I've done this with other when I worked in other fields. If you raise the education level and credentialing level of any particular field, you raise their ability to make more money and create more value for their companies as well. So we, uh, Robert, is on that with Hector. Uh, we will introduce you after that because that is an excellent, excellent point. None of this works without raising the education levels of everyone, particularly our professional irrigators. Thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, letting me speak quickly and get us back on time. <laughs> I'd like to introduce, it's my honor, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jenny Bauer with the Soil Health Institute, and she's going to be talking about effective measurements of soil health. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk and introduction. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm here from North Carolina today. Uh, and uh, I'm a research soil scientist with the Soil Health Institute, which is based in North Carolina. Although we work um, all over the continent in the US and Canada, uh, and I want to speak to you today about some effective measurements of soil health or some work we've done to try and uh, uh, aid in standardizing measurement of soil health. So this is the Soil Health Institute. Um, we're a pretty big team and we're a 501c3 nonprofit with about a third of our funding coming from federal um, sources, a third from private and a third from uh, foundations. And our mission is to safeguard and enhance the uh, vitality and pr productivity of soils through scientific research and advancement. So to that end, we're made up of scientists and, um, and soil health educators, uh, and as well as economists and modelers. Another goal of ours is to measure soil health to develop locally relevant resources for land managers and uh, and therefore quantify the impacts of regenerative practices. So why do we do this? Um, this field is not in Yuma, as you can guess. Um, but uh, I think it's a good uh, example of why soil health matters. So this is one soil uh, with the same crop, and it's, it's basically one field, but it's just got a fence in the middle. And on one side, we're using soil health practices so decreased tillage, um, throwing in some cover crops, and retaining residue. And on the other side, uh, we've got a pretty high, uh, high tillage intensity, uh, no cover crop, and probably monoculture environment. It's just after a rain, and the water has really ponded on the surface of, this, of the field on the right, and is probably running off, uh, so leaving quickly, and not able to adequately infiltrate into that soil. But on the left, um, you can see that that water has soaked into the soil very efficiently. And in fact, um, it's going to stick around, right? Since it's not leaving uh, by runoff, it's going to be accessible by the plants. Um, so this, this uh, uh, kind of gets at how soil can be uh, pretty, pretty man magical for water management. Uh, we already, uh, Joey introduced this definition for soil health as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. I think it's a great definition. Um, but in order to quantify soil health, we need to settle on the right indicators of soil functions, right? Soil supplies a lot of functions, which I'm sure, um, which, which are gotten to by that definition. Um, but we also need to interpret indicator values in the proper context. And so I have a soils background, and uh, I, I've seen uh, quite a few soils in the field. Um, and so when I think about soil health, part of me is thinking about that incredible diversity of soil systems. And I've represented two of these up here today. So the soil on the left is a quite deep, you know, meters deep, um, soil that has really striking redox features. Those are those um, bright orangey red masses and gray spots in the bottom of the profile. And that indicates that water is there uh, most, uh, quite frequently or, or most of the year. Um, we're going to measure soil health differently in that soil than we do in the one at right, which is about 12 inches of soil over bedrock. 
So water is going to behave di differently in these soils, and so is soil health. To get at the first question, um, you know, how, what are the most effective indicators of soil health? We launched the North American Project to Evaluate Soil Health Measurements. We call it NAPSHM. It's not really the coolest you know, acronym. I think ARID was really good. I've heard a lot of good acronyms today, um, but that's what we call it. Um, and the goal of this was to identify the most effective indicators of soil health. Um, and this was, this was kind of building on, so Louisa mentioned our tier one and tier, tier, tier two indicators. We were really trying to figure out which ones of those can give us the big, biggest bang for our buck. And the way we studied this was across 124 long-term experimental sites. And these are paired treatments um, that study uh, differences in tillage or cover crops and crop rotations. We collected soil samples from 0 to 15 centimeters in depth and tested over 30 measurements. You can see there's quite a, a broad, um, so, so the temperate, uh, sorry, the, the colors here, um, I believe, are, are showing the climate gradient. So we, we tested uh, across a range of, um, of precipitation and temperature, and we included a few sites from Arizona, a bunch of sites in Mexico and, um, and California to, um, to help us study this across the entire continent. Yep. Uh, these are just some of our uh, crops and treatments in the, in the trials. So you know, corn and cotton and sorghum might be more relevant here, but of course uh, you don't see vegetables. That We did test this in, in vegetable systems. Um, we also, uh, so the, uh, I'm showing the range of management practices on the right as well. Uh, so we've got tillage, uh, biodiversity, cover crops, residue management, manure, a lot of the practices that we know uh, build soil health in agricultural systems. And then these are all of the indicators we measured. So uh, car different carbon indicators, different nitrogen indicators, water and structure, um, of course getting at uh, the biological community with some of the methods we've already discussed today. Uh, and then a range of uh, chemical and fertility uh, indicators as well. So quite a lot of indicators here, and our, our, our job, um, as we viewed it, was to kind of filter these down to see which of these indicators are applicable across this wide range of temperature and precipitation across different commodity systems, um, and, and which ones reflect the practices that we know uh, improve soil health. So what did we find? Well, first we found that site factors absolutely do affect uh, the, the absolute values of measurement. <laughs> Maybe absolute wasn't right to use twice there, but, um, but basically what I'm saying is that the actual value of, for example, soil organic carbon is going to vary based on temperature. Um, and so getting at that clim climate gradient, and then also based on clay content. So, you know, what, is the, what are the special characteristics of that soil um, that, that make it different from other soils? That's going to be the texture, um, the drainage properties, um, and so forth. Uh, so we found, of course, there, there's going to be less soil organic carbon with rising temperatures and higher soil organic carbon with higher clay contents. And that makes sense based on what we know from the literature. Next, we looked at each um, indicator and its response to, um, to different soil health practices. So I've, I've listed um, some common soil health practices among our treatments here. Uh, so uh, basically, the way this works, we took um, a meta-analysis approach and then looked at the, uh, the magnitude of the effect between these paired treatments um, according to the soil health indicator. So here, for example, decreased tillage. Um, so, so if we looked at a, a paired treatment with uh, high tillage and low tillage, the effect of that decreased tillage gave us about a 10% increase in soil organic carbon. And these are bounded by the 95% confidence intervals. Uh, so you can see that uh, actually, Residue retention, organic nutrients, cover crops, and decreased tillage all gave us um, responses, positive responses um, in soil organic carbon. But rotation di diversity and crop count actually uh, didn't give us a, a measurable effect for soil organic carbon. 
And we looked at these across different carbon measurements and, and for each column, you know, just looking at what is going to give us the, high, the biggest response. And this allowed us to filter our measurements down. I'm just going to choose um, the, the potentially mi mineralizable carbon. I you know these acronyms are horrible, but basically PMC24 and PMC96 are similar methods. It's just the length of time that we're, we're doing that, um, that mineralizable carbon test. Um, and we found that actually the 24-hour um, test uh, was, was more, uh, was able to detect uh, the effect of management better than the 96-hour test. So we, we've got um, better sensitivity to residue retention and decreased tillage. So that helped us filter it down. However, we also wanted to look at the cost and availability of measurements. And if folks are here who are affiliated with labs, I'd love to talk to you about um, what we ended up la landing on, um, whether you'd be interested in incorporating our tests. But we found there was a lot of range in how much um, labs were charging and then which labs were able to run which tests. So we don't want to recommend beta -glu glucosidase enzyme activity if only two labs can run it. Um, oops. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that our measurements weren't redundant with each other. So across the board, we found that actually, um, you, know, you know, there's some wonderful uh, nitrogen soil health tests out there, like potentially mineralizable nitrogen, um, total nitrogen, um, wet extractable organic nitrogen. Um, but we found that carbon actually is pretty efficient at telling us about nitrogen. So across the board, these carbon indicators were correlated with nitrogen indicators. Uh, so in order to, again, have the most bang for our buck, we, uh, we wanted to uh, recommend a minimum uh, number of tests. So this just shows the filter. We wanted measurements that reflect soil health, respond to management practices, are applicable at scale, and that gets to that price and availability, and then measurements that are not redundant with a more direct indicator. So I'm really excited that this work was published last spring. Um, it's, uh, it's called just a minimum suite of soil health indicators for North American agriculture. And you can scan that QR code. And I think the important thing here is that we did find that across that temperature and precipitation gradient, there was um, variation in the absolute value of these indicators. But it was effective across that, in picking up management signals across that range um, in climate. Uh, so the ones we settled on were organic carbon, carbon mineralization uh, potential uh, through a 24-hour uh, respiration, aggregate stability through uh, slaking and image analysis, and then plant available water. And that's calculated from organic carbon and texture. So really three and then a fourth that's calculated. Um, I'm going to break for a brief com commercial here, but no, no, sorry, I'm still going. <laughs> but, um, uh, so uh, I'm excited to announce that uh, on World Soil Day, we actually released uh, an app that allows you to measure the third indicator that um, I mentioned, and that's called Slakes. So um, uh, we have a laboratory grade uh, R script that, um, that we use to do this um, at a sort of a, a research grade scale, but you can do it on your smartphone and get pretty good results um, with nothing more than a couple Petri dishes. Um, so download it, uh, all you need are some, some little soil aggregates and some water and some Petri dishes and you can measure your own wet aggregate stability. Um, I just want to throw a few slides up about how we're scaling these measurements and implementing them because that's kind of the most important part, right? So um, we're assessing these soil health indicators across um, ge geographic regions by, um, by first identifying which regions are, we're going to study, identifying local management systems, mapping the soils to make sure we're, um, we're relating measurements on, on soils with similar properties. We're collecting soil samples and then measuring these and interpreting the data uh, to eventually create farmer reports and regional fact sheets, um, webinars, et cetera. And this is where we're doing all this. So you can see there's a pretty big gap um, in, uh, in the Southwest. So if you want to collaborate, let's work together. I have business cards. Um, get in touch with the Soil Health Institute. We would love to do more work in this region. Currently, our main commodities that we work in are corn and soybean, dairy feed, and cotton. That makes sense. These are the big commodities, right? Um, and the way we're, we're, um, that we're uh, conducting these measurements relies 
a lot on actually stratifying soil type. Um, so I can't, I don't have time to get into this too much today, but basically you all know that we have a really complicated, really beautiful um, soil map of the United States um, that has been painstakingly created by on the ground soil scientists. Uh, but we know that you know, soil health is, is responsive to texture um, and also drainage, and we can actually relate and reduce the soil map based on those properties. So we can, um, we can know that, okay, this, this soil might be slightly different in, you know, a slope or parent material, but it's got pretty similar, like, infiltration properties um, and, um, and might, res might uh, have similar soil health measurements based on those inherent properties. So we lumped the soil triangle um, and also grouped the drainage categories to get at this. All right, in summary, uh, we found that site factors affect soil health measurements, but across the continent, continent, our minimum suite of measurements reflect soil health, they respond to management, they're applicable at scale, and, um, and they're non-duplicative. We're not saying these are the only indicators. You, you probably want to add you know, an indicator if you're more interested in the biology or, or a certain side of this, but we want to make this grower focused and scalable. Um, and then we're working to increase commercial laboratory capacity, as I mentioned, so if you, idea, uh, if you have ideas to that, please get in touch. I'm almost done, sorry. And then, again, stratifying soils helps us compare similar soils. All right, thank you. When was the Slakes app release that you just showed? Because I've used a previous mm -hmm. Slakes app and... And you yeah. didn't like it. Well, <laughs> it likes to crash. It does like to crash. That's, so that's why we made a new one. Um, it's because the behind the scenes algorithm was trying to do a lot. We were able to simplify that. So this is a new release. Um, so it's, it's been updated. This won't crash on you, or at least it hasn't crashed on me. So how does the Soil Health Institute tend to work with universities and do you view like what you all are doing at FA, you, you, you heard my spiel about DASHI and the Art of the Soil Health Initiative. Have you had similar collaborations before you view us as competing or is that, you know, what are you using as the opportunities to work together besides us generating data for you? I mean, how can it be mutual? That's a great question. Um, as someone who's only been at the Soil Health Institute for less than a year, I'm going to speak fully to this. Um, no, I don't. I don't view there as as being yeah um, competition. Well, I think I think we have a, a leverage with industry partners that is um, that is pretty. Um, pretty big in, in regional scale. And I think that's an advantage we might be able to bring in like working across systems. Um, and we, um, we can, so we can leverage partners who might work like all across the country or in multiple geographies like California plus Arizona. We have a couple projects that are working in like seven different geographies. And I think those are really powerful for getting insights and then again, like scaling. I, th I think we can scale. So um, why do we need to irrigate? Like typically we irrigate to uh, fill the soil profile, the root zone with proper amount of water, which is necessary for you know, plant growth. And at the same time, we need to leach salts below the root zone. Uh, if you take a look at the picture on the uh, bottom left, you would see three conditions in the soil. The first one on the right, this is soil at permanent wilting point, so there is no water for the plant to use. The middle one is at field capacity, where you have enough amount of water for plant to use, and the one on the left at saturation, which is your, it has uh, more than enough, and the amount left would be going below the root zone through deep percolation. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we apply more water than needed, and uh, why would that happen? For example, there are different scenarios. One of them would be um, overestimation of crop evapotranspiration. This is one of them. And uh, same thing for the leaching fraction, we apply too much. Uh, or a poor irrigation system design and uh, maintenance. For example, you may have uh, like closer better than necessary. Or in another situation, you'd have sprinkler heads that have more fluoride than needed. And also uh, by the absence of like uh, 
drainage system or proper drainage system. And you have one of two routes for the extra water. One is that they would go through deep percolation below the root zone, and the other one is through runoff, depending on the soil. And what would be the impact of applying too much water? So the first one would be water logging, as you see in the picture on the top. You have too much water standing um, in the field. And the result also would be soil compaction. So if you are using uh, heavy machinery in soil with too much water, that's not good. Reduced nutrient uptake, uh, damage for the root system, uh, negative impact of soil uh, microbiome. I'm sure you have heard about it from previous presentations. And uh, also damage for the soil structure. Uh, another thing would be weeds. You'd have lots of weeds in the field, uh, raising water table, and in general, affecting your growth negatively, and you'd have uh, bad soil health. So the opposite would be that you are applying less than needed, right? And the reason for that would be our situation now, we don't have enough water. Uh, another thing also is underestimation of crop evapotranspiration and leaching fraction. Uh, poor irrigation system, like having bigger spacing between emitters, so you are not applying enough and you have emitter clogging because you are not using proper uh, asset protocol, for example, for your drip system. And the impact would be water stress for the plant, reduced growth and yield, and salt accumulation. But there are, you know, whenever you have salt issues, for example, or drip systems, the solution for that to be to apply the amount that you need to apply per week on, uh, at more frequency. Like, for example, you'd run your system five times a week or six times a week. And there is research that proves that point and also by applying acid. So when we apply acid, for example, for drip irrigation systems, we apply it before the sand filter or the media filter to give it a chance to react with the salts, and you'd have deposit on your, deposit on your uh, media filter, and then water would go clean to the plant. And we need to monitor the salinity in the soil as well. So we have lots of uh, soil moisture sensors that would measure the salinity level in your field. So you'd have an idea if you have an issue, you can try to correct it as you go. And in this situation, you would have limited number of crops you can grow because of the salinity and you'd have to grow a special crops that would tolerate water stress. So we agree that we have to apply proper amount of water, not much, not less. So how to do that? So we need to, first, for example, we can use soil moisture sensors. Uh, I've seen some sensors that would give you upper and lower limits based on your crop and soil texture, and then you can use that to you know, uh, see how much water you need to apply, and you have to be within these two limits. The other thing is to use uh, an irrigation model that would require, if it's a, if the model would require like weather data and some gross parameters about the plant and some soil uh, parameters like soil texture, and then you can calculate crop evapotranspiration, right? And the model, if it's what's called the soil water balance model, basically it calculates how much you put in the soil, how much goes out, like this equation, and then you can get a calculation for crop evapotranspiration. But we also need to consider salinity. So you have to apply a little bit more to take care of the salinity, leach it below uh, the root zone. So leaching fraction is applying a little bit more water so you can take care of the salinity leach it below the root zone. We have an equation here, but we don't have to get the farmer worried about the equations. It is, you know, we can calculate it or you can use a graph on the right. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't move to that one. So this graph, it's very simple. So the equation is based on two parameters, measuring the electrical conductivity or salinity for the water and measuring the salinity for the soil paste extractor for the soil. So the vertical one or the y-axis is for the soil, the other one is for the water. So if assuming that your soil at six and your water is 2.2, they would meet at 10%. So you need to apply 10% more water to take care of your salinity. So 
To maintain good soil conditions, we need to avoid, for example, compactions. Don't use heavy machinery on uh, wet soil. And we need to uh, use some uh, technologies like the laser leveling uh, on a regular basis, using irrigation systems with high distribution uh, uniformity, like the drip system, which doesn't fit everything, but in general, it has higher distribution uniformity because water would go through like laterals and drip tapes. And we need, we need to use soil moisture sensors. And also, we can use satellite data, something like OpenET. OpenET would give you estimation of your crop uh, or actual evapotranspiration for your field. And it's free, very easy. If you need more information about this, we can provide. They provide daily, monthly, and yearly data for your field. And also, we have to um, grow drought tolerant crops, like Waiuli corn and other crops. Of course, there are other, like vegetables. But if you have the choice, you would use a crop like this in that condition. And also we have to grow crops to restore soil, he soil health conditions by following a proper uh, crop rotation. I'm sorry, I was late in this one. So we have some um, case studies that we did at Maricopa Agricultural Center. So the first one uh, is, you know, uh, Title for it is water use germination growth and yield for cotton under two different irrigation systems. One is gravity drips, the other one is flood using uh, varied irrigation rates. So the gravity drip is a system that doesn't require pumping. So it's based on gravity. And uh, it delivers the water through drip tapes and emitters. And so we are applying exactly what you need to apply, uh, water and fertilizer. Easy to install and operate, it's a very simple system. However, we, you may have some problems with clogging if you don't use proper uh, acid protocol. And we tested three different irrigation rates, applying 100% of crop evapotranspiration, 80% and 60. Uh, the other one is the flood irrigation, which is known for everyone. It's a system not for its average efficiency, but some places like in Yuma, they are really efficient. I think they can reach like 75% with flood. Uh, it has some deep percolation and leaching, you know, uh, for fertilizer if you don't, uh, you know, watch what you're applying. Uh, easy to install, it's a well-known system for a long time. And in our situation, we had an alpha-alpha valve at the beginning of the field, and it would deliver the water directly to the uh, furrows. So we used a, what's called the neutron moisture meter, which is the one on the right in the picture. It's a soil moisture meter used for research, basically, not for farms. It's very accurate. It gives us soil moisture content, and we convert that into depletion, like how much is the depletion, so we know how much we need to apply. So these are like curves for the irrigation plus rain, which is the dashed line, the blue line, and the orange one is for soil water depletion. So we try to keep our soil water depletion for the drip at 30% depletion, and for the flood at 60% depletion. So the results, it was a cotton experiment. We, re we realized that the more it, amount of water you apply, it would, it would give you more number of balls, right? And uh, so the bottom one is the one received the least amount of water. And for the yield, we had the highest yield was D100, which is a drip receiving 100% of crop evapotranspiration, so the higher rate, followed by the flood receiving 100%, and then the drip receiving 80, and drip receiving 60%, after the last one was uh, flood receiving 80%. So the drip receiving 60% of crop evapotranspiration was better than the flood receiving 80%. So um, we, we, as I said, we had some clogging issues, but uh, we are testing a different asset protocol. We repeat this experiment next year and hopefully it will succeed. I expect that drip receiving 80% the gravity drip receiving 80% should give higher yield than the flood receiving 100%. The reason for that is um, water is applied exactly in the root zone. And in the first year, we didn't have that because we had massive growth for the vegetative growth. 
from the D80 and D100. And we couldn't control through uh, gross regulators because our plots were four rows wide and the sprayer was six rows. So we couldn't really spray exactly for, specifically for the 80% and 100% or drip under 80 and 100%. So we had to spray the entire field, so we affected the low treatments. So we had to spray only once at full rate and another time at half rate and we stopped. But next time, we're going to have six meter uh, or six beds. That way we can spray specific plot to reduce its vegetation growth and this would affect the final yield. So the second study is for OpenETs, who OpenET is a satellite-based method to evaluate uh, actual crop evapotranspiration. So we are uh, evaluating that as compared to uh, using uh, an irrigation model. You know, so we went to one of the farmer's field, it's about 70 miles from Maricopa Agricultural Center. We installed some soil moisture sensors as you see in the picture on the top. Two sensors, uh, I mean about like eight sensors in the field. And as you can see from the figure here, so the red one is for the open ET and the green one is for WINS model, which is the irrigation model. We had very good agreement with the irrigation model. The study is still going on for three years. We are going to move the equipment to different fields and different groups to continue the evaluation. But in general, we have very good results until now. So the last one is an experiment we are starting in March. So now we are installing the drip systems in a 12 acre field at Maricopa Agricultural Center. Uh, sorry, 12 acres at Maricopa Agricultural Center where we are testing three irrigation systems, center pivot, pressurized drip and uh, flood under two irrigation rates, 100% and 80% of crop evapotranspiration. And uh, we, we will have winter and summer crops for three years. We are having plots with soil amendment, without soil amendment. So we have lots of good um, factors to study. And we'll have different soil uh, moisture sensors to test. We encourage everyone, if you'd like to come and participate in the experiment, for example, if someone is working on the soil or plant disease or anything like that, it would be nice if they can come and they'll be willing to collaborate with them. So uh, in conclusion, like proper irrigation management would increase irrigation efficiency, soil health, crop growth and crop productivity. Pressurized system may increase water saving and irrigation efficiency. Uh, using deficit irrigation may improve crop uh, uh, productivity and soil health. And, uh, but we need to monitor the field continuously. So sensors and satellite data and uh, maintenance is the main thing for any drip irrigation system and applying uh, extra amount of water for leaching. My average value would be about 15% for leaching. Thank you. If you have any question, let me know. I'll just get up. What did you Thank spray? You. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what's the name for what we sprayed, but we, you know, we followed the directions of the farm manager there. So I, I'm not sure which, which one specifically was sprayed. But we used a uh, gross regulator you know, for twice. Yeah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Let's start again, okay? It's, it's early in the morning. It's 8 a.m. right now. Just wake up. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity. Now, we have been talking about soil health a lot. I'll tell you stories, okay? Um, I'm not going to discuss many details. What I'm going to do today is talk about some of my projects that I started. By the way, today I grew two years old in University of Arizona. I started exactly two years ago. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I cannot say that I'm new anymore. Uh, well, yeah. So I'll start with my team uh, because these people helped me do all this work that I'll show. Uh, uh, two of them still working with me. Some of them are interns and one of them, Eric, He's from Texas a &M. he was here. He comes and works in my lab and then leaves uh, for his course. So um, these people are making everything happen. Now I will start directly uh, about my project. So starting with uh, a needs assessment survey, which is kind of a, you know, what do you follow in an extension guideline that you need to know 
what your stakeholder needs, right? Uh, early in my career, I don't know if everyone knew back then that I was there, uh, and they probably took this survey. I'm thankful for them. Um, 107 responses I received. Uh, Robert helped me a lot uh, uh, getting those things done. I was new. I didn't know how to approach all the time. So um, what we found here is uh, there are many interests, okay? And we talked about soil health, around soil health, because it was a soil health needs survey. Um, we found that biology and understanding the baseline uh, where they are right currently, those two are more than 50% people are speaking about. And on the other hand, when you were talking about soil health, John kind of mentioned in the morning, it's soil fertility and you know other soil, physical, chemical, and biological needs. So water conservation, we are in the desert, everywhere water conservation is an important thing. You cannot find me a place where it's not a big deal. And I keep talking about that. So we recently published this because I've been told that, hey, you have to publish, people need to read. So I published this. You can find this article. If you cannot, you can reach out to me. I'll share. Um, to, uh, I, I uh, will say a little, little bit about the indicators. So there are two slides. Organic matter we know, or organic carbon we know. Uh, poxy, now we know. Uh, we, we have been speaking about it. Some people used to call it active carbon. Then they said, no, 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 active is not a good term. It's vague. Um, not, pe don't, not many people like it anymore. Um, but uh, ultimately, there are certain labs that still runs them. So for a grower to go to a lab and ask soil health analysis, I think they still will do poxy. It's, 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 it's a more available fraction of carbon that is available to the microbes and the biology. Um, respiration is a, a way to understand uh, how well they're respiring, how active the microbes are. Uh, PMN, mineralizable nitrogen, a source or um, uh, available that will be available in future uh, as nitrogen and available nitrogen. Protein is another source in soil of nitrogen. Uh, weight aggregate stability is a physical property. Uh, talking about uh, how well the soil can move any kind of fluids, uh, how well roots can grow, how well the foundation is. Um, I told you those because I, I'm presenting this data and uh, talking about a couple of those. Um, so this is a soil health survey, and you can see we went around 109 different fields around, um, around the state, and a uh, couple of different projects. One project was funded by uh, YCEDA, thankful to them. It's very early in my career. I needed that. Um, so we, we created, uh, so we're working on this project right now, we are trying to create a, a more meaningful um, you know, data set. Um, but you can see the ranges where we are. Uh, I have more uh, inclusive data set like uh, what region you are. If you're in the southwest versus southeast versus central, north, central, and southern. You know, where you are, depending on that, we have different ranges for these parameters, and these are not only the parameters that we're working with, we have other parameters, so we'll probably publish it this year sometime. Uh, this is the work that I, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad that YCD supported us, and this is a publication that is already out, not talking a lot about data, but more about how, what those data means, okay? Why we're talking about protein or PMN or poxy, kind of explaining those. Um, now, sanitizers. Uh, I have a project that started uh, last year. Well, not last year, it's 2022 now. October 2022, that season, uh, I got another project going on. So this is an ongoing project. What we're looking at is um, what happens to soil health when you apply sanitizers, water treatments. You ask that questions, and can we answer some of those uh, questions? Uh, you know. Um, uh, Matt said that he, he found phenotypic evidence, like the crops did not grow. Can we find soil evidence that, well, crop, crops won't grow? Um, I have very initial data. Don't judge me on this. It's first year data. We cannot say much about it. Uh, we worked with uh, five different farms uh, and fields. Uh, so they are uh, geographically 
uh, distinct, they're separated, so the range of numbers are uh, high, uh, but we, we are seeing not much, not much. So some people took it. If you did not take it, uh, please take this survey. I'm trying to learn how much our stakeholders know about sanitizers so that we know if we could create some knowledge for them around sanitizers. Um, see, the, the data doesn't say much. There is no statistically significant difference pre and post application of sanitizer. On, on, the, on, those, on these parameters, even other soil parameters, we didn't see much. Um, and these are all soil parameters. Except for a couple of numbers are trying to make uh, sense. Uh, and very recently, like day before yesterday, I was looking at our enzyme data and nitrogen-based enzyme uh, glucosaminidase, um, uh, Jenny showed that um, we have the data, but it is first time I'm seeing something there too. So there, is may, there may be something with nitrogen cycle. It's, it's epoxy, which is carbon and nitrogen, kind of. Protein is nitrogen, and the nitrogen-based uh, enzyme showing some response, and uh, I need to look more deeper. So I did not show it uh, here. Uh, I, I need to recheck because my students did the calculations. I have to check it. It happened day before yesterday. I need to take time. Um, we also looked into different chemistries, chlorine-based and PAA-based, um, and we can see, well, statistically not different because different sites, okay, a lot of variation. But you can still see some, some, some difference in numbers, uh, pre and post, green is pre, post, yellow is post, you know, um, and we could see the PAA-based ones, I mean, it's very initial data, but we could still see something happening with the PAA-based uh, uh, fields, uh, PAA-based sanitizers when applied to the fields, but not conclusive because now I, I separate the uh, sites and we could see all different kind of relationship, you know, uh, some, some also increased. Uh, and this is all soil protein, talking about soil protein, the nitrogen-based uh, soil health indicator. Um, but the, the other thing is, Four of those sites used chlorine-based, just one side with PA, so cannot say much, but we're, we're digging into it. This year we have more sites, we have eight or nine sites. Uh, thankful to my cooperators uh, who, was, who are working with me. Um, we'll see, we'll see what happens uh, next year. Cover crop, we know the good things. We have been sampling. I am very much um, reluctant to uh, grow cover crops. Uh, with a lot of water, so I, I was looking for options to grow cover crops with less water, but I also am not doing single species cover crops. Uh, I think we have some data, so I started doing mixed cover crops. Now I know it's hard to sell mixed, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking at cover crop biomass data and how much nutritional value they have, trying to think about a, a mixed crop salad for cows or, or sheep, you know? All different kinds of cover crops. You know, we, we all know because with, with less water, uh, if you have only single species, some, uh, the, the, the probability of failure is 50%. Now you start increasing the number of species, the probability goes down. Um, and we have seen pretty good results when you have legumes and grasses growing together, uh, but it's very hard sell for the dairy industry. They, they're not used to it, so I know I need to do a lot of work. Uh, and, and might be it's, it's good for grazing, uh, but we'll see, we'll see. But I'll show you some data. A lot of different species that we worked with. Uh, I'm not interested in soil health that much because in one or two years, you cannot look at soil health that much. So we could see some improvement, but you know, all different. So uh, just to tell you, 100% broadleaf, 30% grass, 70% broadleaf grass versus broadleaves I'm working with, different ratios, different time of the season. Uh, this is fall, summer, winter, uh, different field sites. And these are all commercial sites. Uh, this is the data I'm trying to sell to people. These are all um, feed quality data and see alfalfa and barley hay average data. And this is alfalfa, like good quality alfalfa data, not not premium, but not poor. And look at the water use, the tonnage, 
I, I, I was new then, I, I, I didn't have a lot of funding, couldn't like, do this, the biomass. Uh, it was very early in my career, but I started collecting more biomass data. My data is pretty close to, uh, probably sometimes better than barley, right? So we published this article. If you're interested, please take a look. Shoot me questions, argue with me, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I, I would love to hear from you. Um, now I work with Pedro on this project. He and his lab developed a sensor that can measure carbon dioxide uh, emissions. Uh, it's a very cheap, the idea is, so we can scale, uh, we can give it to growers and they can check their uh, management system, how well one or other things are working. But we're still understanding the, you know, uh, the, the, the pattern of the emission. Uh, and trying to correlate with soil parameters, plant parameters. Now, uh, we have uh, uh, one of the story here, as you see, when you had cover crops versus when you had a fallow, when you grew cotton, um, the, the, the emission of carbon is too high for when you had cotton after a fallow. But if you had a cover crop, the emission is low. So you are losing less carbon through carbon dioxide. But if you would like to know more, please hit this publication. It just came out uh, December 20th. So it's a, our brand new publication. It, it's pretty, I have other data in this uh, publication, uh, but we are, we are moving forward with this project too. Um, very recently we published this, uh, not did not publish yet. We just calculated all the data. We had this, this spring, last spring, we had a Durham wheat project with Barley and Durham wheat, Arizona Grain Research and Promotion Council. People talk about deficit irrigation. Most of the people use flood irrigation. Flood irrigation, deficit irrigation, does it work? Uh, so we, we, we used 15% and 30%. Not, many, not much deficit though. Uh, we use skip irrigation. Uh, pretty popular varieties. You cannot. Uh, there is big yield reduction just with 15% uh, under, under flood irrigation. If you have flood irrigated plots, you, you cannot really depend on deficit irrigation. Did not see much about soil health improvement either. Uh, there is nothing that can negate the effect of uh, the deficit irrigation. I, I, I found that, that it, it probably doesn't work for flood irrigation, but this is just one year data if anyone is interested. I'm not going to ask for funding anymore, but if anyone is interested, I would love to join. So with that, uh, Dia talked about this project, this is our one ongoing project, uh, and this is our new project. A lot of people talked about snake oils. I'll test some of the snake oils on cotton, and that's it. I do extension outreach, and thank you. If you have any question, I'd love to hear. So no, that about the Durham, you see that there, like a reduction in yield uh, when you took out like the 30%, 15 or 30% of the irrigation, but did you use the same seeding rate and also in the skip irrigation that you didn't apply to the deficit was applied nitrogen. And so with skipping like right. water, it was a low input versus a high input? Or? No, no. So I did not put any, any nitrogen when I applied those, uh, I skipped those irrigation. No nitrogen was applied on those occasions. And it was the same seed rate, same variety, everything same. Only we did, and we applied the skip in April, so it's pretty late in the season. It's not in the early in the developmental stage. So did pretty good, but then I suddenly cut uh, some irrigation, one and two. So total seven, we cut one, 15%, two, 30% around. So there was no other, other changes, only irrigation. Well, I mean, I, mean I, I was stuck in, I was stuck on my main uh, thing right here is to get value on irrigation and I was talking to team from San Diego, I don't know if he's still here, but he was telling me about a device for uh, measuring the moisture, right? right. And I'm like, uh, and yeah, I told him, yeah, I know about one, I mean, I mean, I, and I work for Gila Valley Farm right. in, in the past, and I know we use a device for, uh, for uh, when we uh, from uh, watermelon. Right. And uh, and he, and and but his device was telling me that it, uh, it can it can register. I mean, which flood mushroom? Yes. Yeah. And plus, it's a, it's a it's a, it's like a, so it's a big device. It's connected. It uses an app. Yeah. 
And I was like, uh, that's, I mean, that saves, I mean, that's, I, I'm assuming that's what farmers want, save money, devices that save money, because at the end of the day, you stop someone from driving and use this one and this and that, right? Yeah, and, and Dia, Dia works on some of those sensors. So you can probably have data on your phone even, so you don't have to drive like you said. And, and you can irrigate uh, more precisely, more efficiently, exactly. if you follow that. So yeah, those are, those are not very expensive, by the way. Those are not very expensive. Good afternoon. Um, all right, so that's the title of my, of my presentation. I'll be talking about sensors and how they can be applied potentially to the case of uh, soil health uh, research. So I'm bringing ideas. I'd like to present the, the, some of the things that I do and how they can, be, they can find a niche within this line of research. And to get started, I wanna, I'm gonna use this, this uh, diagram. This is a microbial fuel cell diagram. And I got me two points to reflect as I was checking this paper. And one of them is that you see that this is what, hap this is what happens when we have uh, electrodes in contact with carbon in a metal. So there is a, um, it generates electrons, a flow of electrons. That means there's a current flow and there's a potential developed that is power. So my reflection is this, is two, two, th two things. One is how amazing are those microorganisms, they can produce electric power. I didn't know that. I know nothing about biology, by the way, I'm an engineer, and uh, I found that very interesting. The second thing is how simple is this model and how complex is the stuff that we do when we go deeper into our research. So I wish it will be this simple. Okay, so to set the tone of my, my talk, I'll, I'll be, um, brief on, on some uh, uh, concepts, some elements that I think is important. And um, this goes along with the last two talks about soil health, uh, Jenny and, and the banker. So I like to say that when, when we do our work, it's always at a field scale. And I found it very, very challenging, the scale element of it. So you see the picture on the left, there is a, a very, very uh, visual difference in soil properties. Okay. So I will ask the question, when we, see, when we see a field, we want to take a sample out of the field, where to take it? So it's a, it's a scale component. That's why we do in our, in our work that I'm gonna show you is we do, um, we use mobile systems to, to do more on the go sensing to, to try to improve that, that element. Now the second one is about <coughs> the management. It's always going to impact our measurements, okay? And this is one that is obvious. It's a, it's a situation where we have uh, soil compaction produced by getting uh, heavy equipment into moist soil. That's gonna cause comp compaction and it's going to affect our ability to take uh, measurements. Not our ability, I'm sorry, that, that's, that, that's not correct. What it's gonna affect is, our, is the, the quality of information because the compaction is just going to go very, very high. So scale dependency, system dimensionality, in soil health research is, I expect it to be very, very complex and very challenging. Okay, so my talk is gonna be about six sensors, six examples that I have prepared for you. And all those six sensors are functional pieces of equipment in the Precision Act program. The principles of operation vary. And there's a, there's a benefit of that. Mechanical, electrical, spectral, chemical. So two, I mean four different uh, systems and that, that gets uh, benefits in the analysis of the data. Soil properties is soil strength, electrical conductivity, and a combo of soil temperature, moisture content, organic matter, and uh, CEC. And last one is a soil surface CO2 flux that uh, the banker already mentioned about it. So for those of you that are actual soil scientists, I want, to, I want you to pay attention to the last point. It's the main scale factors of variability. Depth, the soil profile, 
what is that the we how we consider that that variation in 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 that z direction uh, what is the area differences that relates to the picture that I showed you earlier and then time is another factor that brings uh, scale let's go with it number one it's a soul strength mechanical sensor it's um, the, all the details in the construction are in this paper so you can check it out uh, I'm gonna be brief in the interest of time I'm not gonna go uh, review all these elements here only to tell you that this is an instrumented shank it has all these different uh, load cells inside the, the shank and it has uh, GNSS data generated everything is collected at this point so this frame moves along the field and collects data on soil compaction in the profile so to give you a visual how this, this uh, operates in the field is, is mounted on the, on the tractor, the frame is mounted on the tractor, and then the blade goes and cuts the soil. Um, and you can see in the picture on the, on the right that there is some level of soil disturbance, um, significant enough not to be deploying this right next to the plants, but it is still uh, possible to deploy this in season. And obviously when it's, uh, um, during tillage preparation, it's much easier to do it. So I'm gonna skip all the details about this um, protocol and, and ways to analyze data, but I'm gonna point to this particular map. This is a transect from zero to 190 meters. Depth goes from surface to 50 centimeters. What you see in red is it's, uh, it's values that exceed a threshold of compaction. We call compaction anything that is above 2.0 megapascals in, in cone index. So here's the thing, 190 meters, the sensor is moving, it's collecting this data, and look at how different it is about 80 meters and about 110 meters down that transect. So I will expect very different microbial activity. The dynamics of mic microbes will be very different in those two because there is a very different condition, physical condition, in, in, uh, in those two points, okay? So keep in mind, again, I'm gonna be hammering this concept of scale. And, okay, second case is something very similar in nature, but different in, in, in operating principle. This is the compenetrometer. It's an automated system that we built, and it, it just goes point on a point basis it, um, it's the same frame and operates out of the same tractor where we take hydraulic power to actuate this, this cylinder. And um, what we do is just we insert this, this probe down to uh, 50 centimeters. Now, this is the output of that particular sensor. I'm gonna describe two, two aspects of it. One is resolution. In this case, we have resolution of one millimeter. Every millimeter down the profile, we have a force and depth piece of information. That's how we build these, these graphs, okay? So that is very high resolution. This is only 30 centimeters uh, all the way to here. And by the way, this is depth. I should have flipped this, this graph 90 degrees. I'm sorry, I forgot about it. But just keep that in mind. In the horizontal axis here, is actually a Z or depth uh, in the vertical. Okay, so that's one point, the resolution. The second point I wanna say is, is about how different these functions appear. These were different soil conditions created just before planting. And where these peaks of higher um, compaction happen, it's actually very meaningful for seed germination and emergence, okay? So if you take the area under the curve for all these three functions, the values are very similar to them. So you basically ignore the location of those peaks. But um, I'm showing you that it's, it's, it's actually very relevant where that is. So again, that's the point of scale, where in the profile these changes happen. I'm gonna move a little faster. 
Um, number three is, uh, is an example of a electromagnetic induction sensor, electrical conductivity apparent. And that's a sensor that is commercially available. Uh, we built this, I'm oh, sorry. We built this frame of PVC because that's something that needs to be non-metal and we run this up and down. In every slide, there is information about how much time we, it takes per, per unit area for us to run these surveys. So I'm gonna omit all that information because it, that's a function of how fast we move in the tractor. That is a, also a function how uh, s that separation between our transects that is completely under our control. Okay, so that can change, but that's only to give you some, some kind of reference uh, value. So with this, we have the advantage of using a piece of software from, from USDA, it's called ESAP. And in this case, uh, you can go all the way from the initial sensor data, clean. Uh, it's normalized by standard deviation over the mean. And the, the software does a, um, a, um, a, that's a process that converts this ECA to ECE. And you can see here in red, this is also an output of the software that tells you for the case of alfalfa, this is the yield that is lost, 100% lost yield in the red. Okay, because there's nothing there. There are no plants, no alfalfa plants because it's so saline up there that there's nothing growing there. Here's my question. Is it the same microbial activity here than down anywhere else? I don't think so, and, I'm, and I know nothing about microbiology. But that's, that's what I'm trying to get my point. Uh, this is another sensor that does something, it collects information that's very similar to the previous one, but it's a more user-friendly unit. Um, I wanna point to this particular graph on the right, and that is the relationship between the sensor output and textural information like, like sand, percent sand. And this is work that we did in, in Safford. And we found a decent correlation that allow us to do prediction of sand content in the whole field, right? So in this case, we go from the sensor output as it is down here, and then a predicted map of soil uh, percent sand, okay? I will bring again the same point. How different will be the uh, microbial activity here than down here? Especially this is sand. It's, it's very, very, very different. And this is work that we did for, for uh, uh, nematode control. Okay, moving on. Number five is, is a, a system that has a combo of sensors in these probes. So this frame that we have, it has four probes and each probe has four sensors. They're listed here. Uh, first is a thermistor, that's to measure soil temperature. Then there is a capacitance-based uh, um, uh, soil moisture content. It get us that. There are two um, wavelength-specific LED uh, light sources and, and, um, and receivers. Okay, so we run this through the field same fashion, and you, you generate this type of maps, okay? In this case, might be related to your question about the distribution of soil moisture in your field. That's something that you can see right here, in the second, second map here, okay? Soil temperature, I will assume that microbial activity is also highly dependent on soil temperature. And look at the, the, the differences. There is a special structure in this data. Last one, this is something that uh, the banker already mentioned, and that is this low cost um, CO2 uh, or soil respiration sensor. The electronics inside this, this uh, unit is about uh, $300, and it's uh, 3D printed, it's water, the, the housing is waterproofed, and we do that for long-term deployment of these sensors. So let me show you some pieces of information about this sensor. So observations that we have, the banker pointed to this, but we see that it's a signal that it responds to the intensity of the biological activity 
during a 24-hour cycle. I'm going to skip many other details, just showing here, this is 24 hours, same day, March 19th, 2022, where there is a fallow field, the, the signal is flat for the most part. But right here, we see the events that are happening at night, and during the day, and at night. So then I ask the question, when you have, or, or there's a time where that microbial activity is changing too, at that scale. So take, that, take my, my talk as something about scale in space and time. Thank you. Just one quick question. Yes, sir. Is your CO2 sensor shielded from wind? Yes. Yeah, so it, it is, uh, the, the electronics are inside the housing, okay? So actually what we do is we try to induce a, a flow of CO2 coming from the ground and then into the atmosphere. So um, I only have 15 minutes and I've been asked to kind of help uh, draw some conclusion from today's workshop and also talk about my program. So I'm going to talk really fast right now. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, soil health and getting the changes made on farm. Okay, so, um, you know, we've got this uh, salinity problem in uh, Arizona, um, where the soil health problem, where it was once uh, controlled naturally by some flooding that used to occur every year, but, you know, we've since put 15 dams on the Colorado River, and we don't really have that flooding anymore. So it's up to us to recharge this uh, soil health uh, ourselves, and really we have a limited amount of ways that we can do it, as you've heard today. Um, so now we got to do it, and we can do it by having different tillage practices, choosing different crops, adding different supplements, and uh, managing our salts, and also uh, changing up our irrigation methods. So uh, really it all comes down to water, which is you know, what we're short on here in Arizona. All life needs water. All life in the soil needs water. And really it's also the only treatment for salinity as well. So we're in a 23-year drought, and so we can't really be fixing our problems with water anymore. We need to look to some alternative uses because as we reduce the, wa the water that we use, we are then increasing the salinity potentially and then causing detriments to soil health. So it is a catch-22 working on this drought irrigation uh, project uh, because we are reducing the amount of water, but we also are negatively impacting soil health. So this is a recent study that's come out from Dr. Sanchez and Dr. French, um, where the water districts of Yuma got together and asked YCETA to put together a project to look at what is the, the consumptive water use of our crops that we grow here in Yuma. Uh, they did a lot of work with the leafy greens and all this. Um, so this is the acre inches that each crop is required to grow the crop. It's evapotranspiration requirements. And in addition, uh, 15 to 20% more water that's needed to control the salts. So this is what you really need to, to grow a crop here in Yuma. These are, these are the, uh, the water readings coming out of that publication. Um, how much water do we have in our supply? Well, every week you can go to a website and um, find out what the Lower Colorado Water Supply Report is. And as you can see, our primary uh, reservoirs of Lake Mead and Lake Powell are at 36 and 35% capacity. So not doing too well. Um, total system uh, contents 43%. Well, it's a lot better than last year uh, at this time, 33%. So it's, we did have a good winter last year, and uh, you know, we have a decent winter this year. So it's good. But you know, every year, we're, we're pulling off of that. So uh, we want to do what we can to reduce our water use. This is kind of how we irrigate all of our crops here in Yuma. Well, a lot of our crops. Definitely the, all the wheat is grown that way. All the uh, Sudan grass is grown that way. That basin flood. Uh, this is also how we manage our salts. We, we just flood a field, um, liquefy that uh, concentrated salt, and push it down deeper into the ground, hopefully going out the side into a drain uh, where it's uh, collected and then uh, as Dr. Bird just said, used to uh, satisfy some of our treaty requirements with, with Mexico. But can, how long can we continue to do this? Um, 
will we have the water do this in the future? That's a big question mark. Uh, pray for rain. Uh, salinity, as I mentioned earlier, reduces soil health. So as we reduce the water that we have, we're causing a problem. Um, so, you know, the stagecoach is under attack here. We, we are facing a huge problem as producers here in Yuma because, um, you know, they're taking away all of our tools that we're using to grow our crops. So how do we deal with this? When, when, when we have a threat, we can either run, we can set up shop somewhere else. I don't really know any other good region, regions that can produce the leafy greens that we can produce in the winter. There's some places in Colorado and things like that, but you know, that's on the, a lot of these places are on the Colorado River as well. So they're gonna be facing these issues too. Um, we can defend, rely on traditional practices, rely on our um, senior water rights to keep the water flowing. Uh, we can, um, you know, do all of our conservation tillage and the gypsum that was mentioned earlier and, um, you know, the, the soil uh, microbes, kind of finding the ones that will deal with the salts, things like that. Uh, but again, our toolbox is limited because we're taking away water and water was our traditional way to conquer the salts that damage the soil health. So really, you know, the, the best option, I think, is to attack. Right, let's find a new plan, let's find new technologies, a lot of which that you've heard today, and find out ways to really streamline them and get them into the hands of the growers so that we can continue to farm for many years to come. Nobody likes change, right? Change is hard. Um, there's something called cognitive dissonance where you, there's one truth that you've accepted, but then you find out that maybe there's another truth too, and so you're stuck in the middle between two truths. Nobody likes that, everybody hates it. Um, change is tough. But it also provides some, some benefit, right? It, if you adopt a new change, if you adopt a new technique, it gives you power, it gives you a sense of control. You are no longer helpless because you are championing this new technology. It allows you to develop new skills, you can try new things, you can um, improve the methods that you're using and track them you can develop new markets. Hey, maybe there is a market out there for soil health. Maybe that regenerative ag brand can get you a little more money uh, in your pocket or help you corner the market. There's some savvy consumers that might be up for that, right? So it's, it's an option, right? It's a, it's a possibility. And then it serves the greater good. You know you're doing good. You're, you're allowing your, your farm to farm longer into the future. You're allowing it to be passed on to the next generation. It's, what better legacy is there than providing a good support network for the next generation? And you're creating a healthy planet too. So really there's a lot of advantages to changing. What are the battles that we're faced with? Well, you can kind of break them up into three different groups. You know, it can be daunting, but if you break it up into three different groups and then just choose one at a time, this might be helpful. We're fighting nature here. Uh, we know that irrigation quality can be uh, pretty bad sometimes. Uh, we know that we're fighting some pH. We know that we have some native microbes in the soil and if we're trying to you know, add some, they're gonna compete. There's, there's lots of issues here. So this is gonna be, I think, the hardest fight is to fight nature, right? We can fight society. These are other growers. These are our customers. Um, we all are facing production pressures. We know that we gotta get that out and they might not care about good soil health or not. We can focus on the return on investment. Uh, how much money is it gonna take to, to have these healthy soils? And is there any added profitability that we can have from that? And then coming from consumer demand, really, uh, and letting that guide our hand. Uh, like Barilla no longer grows here in Yuma, is my understanding, and a lot of that is because of their cu customer demand uh, forcing them out of the region. So uh, that's, that's pretty powerful. Um, and then there's the self, right? There's your own self. Do I stick with what I've been trained with? Do I do what my, my dad did? Do I do what my granddad did? Or do we make a change? Do we decide that I want to take, take on this challenge and perfect my craft? Do I want to have mastery of the land? Do I want to provide stewardship for the next generation? And that's that internal battle. Uh, so this is something called a, an innovation curve or... Um, 
Uh, and it, it really is good at explaining like when a new technology happens, it doesn't just you know, get widely adopted by everyone, it's a process. So you start off with the innovator that has a great idea. Um, you know, they, they have a new technology, they, they, they want to make something new. Their enthusiasm carries, carries them through and it inspires the people around them. It then goes to the first customer, which is the pioneer. Now that pioneer may just love the new. They're not afraid of failing, that's okay with them because they just want to try some new. This is the Steve Alameda's out there. The, the folks that love the new technologies, they'll give it a shot, it's, it's great, it's part of the fun, right? Um, not afraid to fail, they just want to be a part of the good, the new thing. Then that goes to um, the early adopter in the mainstream. Uh, these are your influencers. Uh, these are the folks that will take that knowledge gained by the pioneer and help develop a niche market. Um, they're still very afraid to fail. They don't want to look bad in front of their, their cohorts, but they're okay to take a risk as long as they can develop that niche. Then, as popularity of that idea rises, we have your late uh, tier uh, mainstream adopters. And th for these folks, um, they're going to take all the knowledge that happened with those um, with the early adopters, and they are gonna have that turnkey operation that's probably not gonna fail. For them, what they fear is disruption. Now their systems are different, and when you change one thing, lots of things can change. So as the idea snowballs, that's the issue they're failing. They're no longer afraid of failure, they're afraid of change. Then it goes to the traditionalist. The traditionalist doesn't wanna change at all, ever. They may have to change because the world around them is changing and that's the only way to survive. And that may be the only time you're gonna get them to change. So those influencers, um, you know, it's a, it's a hard road to, to go for change. So I've got about five minutes left and I'm gonna tell you all about my program. So this is, this is extension, cooperative extension. Um, really we follow this four tier approach to getting change done of a needs assessment, research, education, and on-farm change. And if you miss out on one of those steps, you might as well just hang it up because it ain't gonna work. If you don't do your needs assessment, all you get at the end is a pat on the head and say, thank you. This is my team. Uh, right now we've got um, some additional folks on our team. We have three interns from Imperial that are, are coming on from um, um, some, uh, a grant with Belishka and uh, Tanya Hodges. Uh, so they're with us for five weeks, but we typically operate on a crew of five, five uh, interns and uh, two, um, two other staff. Uh, first, we start off with our needs assessment. We've got some great needs assessment done uh, for us by the 2022 um, Cooperative Extension survey that went around. And as you can see, ranking number three is soil health. So this is an in-demand hot topic by lots of the, our constituents in Arizona. Um, the research, I do a lot of work consolidating existing work, collaborating with other researchers. If you're a researcher that uh, uh, presented something today from, from Tucson or you know, from all across the country, I'm happy to take your work and, and put it to work on the farm here in Yuma. We've done over 65 field trials in four years. I love Arizona. We can grow crop after crop after crop. We can harvest one day and plant the next. Uh, mostly focused on uh, the soil, soil health project, projects we're working on, mostly focused on biological, salt mitigation, biochar, fertilizer type projects. Um, and you know, it's hard to assess soil health directly, so all we can do is indirect. How does it affect yield? How does it affect the standard deviation of the yield? You know, how much walk by is there in a the field? Does that product help with that? Through the course of this four years, we've gone through 23 different interns who we've trained up and most of which have gone out into industry and done really well. So we have a very robust program. Um, this is my technician, Ray. He's uh, a full-time technician and also uh, an undergraduate. So he's, he's reaping that uh, tuition uh, reduction benefit. Testing biochars, you know, um, you can't just dump it. It's, I don't wanna go there. Um, and then we're also, um, yeah, it didn't work for me. It didn't work, it, all it did was deactivate the herbicides of the field, so watch out. Um, so we're also, we invented a new irrigation method. This is solid set flood irrigation. We have a patent on this. We're, we're making a um, testing unit and we're gonna take that unit up to the 4-H Maker Lab in Navajo County where, they're gonna, where the high school students there are gonna help us define it and uh, refine it and um, make it better. And then we're gonna you know, take it to a plastic manufacturing plant here in Yuma, print it up, 
and uh, you know, get it out there, it, see if it works, and if it does, we'll share that knowledge. Hopefully this will help with soil health because you're not doing flood irrigation uh, from one, one side of the gate, waiting for it to go all the way across the field, super saturating one side of the field, no irrigation on the other side of the field. So hopefully this will help with that soil health problem by applying water more uniformly in our summer crops, mainly the wheats and the Sudan grasses. This is the testing method that I use uh, here in Yuma um, to test out the products. All my trials are for treatment, six replication. We have an irrigation manifold system, and um, you know we just inject our product. It goes out through the drip, and um, you know we we have that. And then you know there's education. That's the next step after research. I kick out a newsletter. If you want to get on that newsletter, just you know contact me here at this thing. Lots of social media, we organize lots of seminars. We have online on-demand coursework. Uh, so if you go to yumaextension.com, that's where we house all of our work. We have some accredited work and then some for funsies type stuff. We're doing a lot of veterans training now. Um, there's some programs out there that'll do swords to plowshares, to teach our vets all about ag and kind of give them that, that healing. And then we're, we're getting into movies and that's a whole other thing. And then, of course, we're, we're getting on-farm. Uh, so this is how we're getting on-farm, this irrigation efficiency grant. I'm at my time, so I'm just going to move on. But in addition to this, this uh, the, as part of the program, it gives us uh, three years where we're going to the farm, we're working with the farm, we're helping them adopt that new irrigation technology. And I'm telling you what, that's giving us access like we've never had before. And now we can circulate needs assessment, to the people who have been voiceless um, to University of Arizona uh, for quite some time. Now we can get the opinions of irrigators because we're on the farm. Uh, and then also uh, the Ag Apprenticeship Program. This is a state-funded program. Uh, this will give you $10,000 for you to pay, hire an intern of your choice and pay them. Um, and uh, this is our first Yuma candidate, Angel Rodriguez. He was here earlier today. I've got his resume if anybody wants it. I'm trying to land him a job. He's, uh, he's got his high school diploma, 11 years of residential irrigation experience. He wants to be a commercial irrigator. You know how many people want, like coming off the street just want to be a commercial irrigator? He knocked on my door and he said, can you help me be a commercial irrigator? So yes, please. If anybody has any commercial irrigation work that need done, we got your guy. And then lastly, we, we, we bring the research to you. So call me. Um, let's set up a special site visit. We went around with Dia uh, all day, uh, one day, and visited several farms. Uh, we got that FaceTime. And then, um, um, yeah, so that pretty much finishes me out then. So. Bobby knows more about agriculture than all of us. So. Uh, uh, I, did, I wasn't sure. Uh, my old boss said, I said nice things. I was scared being dead. Uh, Robert, where can I get the consumptive use numbers so I can work up some new work for the for my lecture out of it? Perfect. Uh, so on the YCETA website, they have um, Dr. Sanchez and Dr. French's paper uh, that's available, and um, I can give you a direct link uh, is available in my newsletter as well. So the the forty five million dollar grant you got from the state, how much have you used? How much have we used? We have um, allocated $2 million for research uh, and $23 million to the growers. We have uh, basically the rest left. Uh, I will say uh, the U of A took $3 million and we set aside $3 million for um, uh, administrative costs. And I'm, I actually believe that's taxpayer money. And so we're running it extraordinarily lean because we're relying on extension. So most of that I'd like to put right back into the field. We're, we're doing it at about 10%, which is uh, outstandingly good. So with that, I know that's a long way to answer, we have about 13 to 14 million right now that we can add to. I'd like to be able to transfer another one to two, maybe even three million to the growers, so that gives me almost 15. And then whatever the legislature, and then I was talking to our friends at NRCS, whatever I can get to feed this thing next season as well. Yes, sir. Uh, so how do we do that? I have a farmer in Maricopa that wants to use some, a solution. How do I get him? So it's a simple form. It's a one-form deal. And then it goes in front of a committee that reviews it and uh, re validates the, the, the need and assesses the situation to see if they can meet that 20% re reduction in, in water use. And then we go. The money gets right to them. 
and then they purchase, make the purchases, and then we're there for three years just to help them out however they want to help. And, and on that committee, Dia, DeMonte, myself, Robert are all here along with about 10 other extension and industry people. Basically, we, it's a partnership, so we're not looking to catch you. I'm looking to bring as many resources on farm. If I can help you get an equip grant, great. Um, and even, uh, I'll brag a little bit for Dia, it's the relationship, you pick your vendor, you do the design specs, but then we work with you, we'll go on farm. And there was one that was a center pivot out in uh, Pinal County, and Dia went out there and worked with the vendor and reconfigured the, the configuration of the center pivot and shaved about 300,000 off a $4.5 million project. So we do this in partnership, and then we collect the data we're using, trying to get to the micro flow meters at the field level to validate. The initial thing comes from irrigation, your, your irrigation district. Again, we're not trying to catch you, we're trying to help you do a 20% efficiency gain. Also, um, that water remains yours under water law. That was very important to me working with the legislature. I'm not out to take your water rights. I'm out to help you grow more and more efficiently. Uh, how do you get that form? <laughs> I know. He'll help you. There's a, it's on the extension website. Everything is, is automated. Yes, ma'am. Talking about the U of A program, anybody in here who has Arizona or Yuma County farming and whatever, if you qualify for Ethan's program, it's the best deal around. Uh, going through NRCS, you'll tear your hair out and probably scream and holler. Uh, you'll get something done, but it won't be. But if you qualify for Ethan, now is the time to do your work. The money's there, the interest is there, everybody's pushing it. The other thing, if you, whatever inputs you put into these programs that are not covered under a cost share program, which is either NRCS or Ethan's, I have to keep training them on this. There is an Arizona State Conservation Credit that you can claim on your state income taxes up to 75% of the cost of those improvements that came out of your own pocket, you can carry it forward for 10 years. I got lots of guys over the years I've helped that haven't paid taxes. The only time I see them is this one, they need a new tax credit uh, for the Arizona State. But I mean, that's, it's part of the state law uh, out of the 1980 um, Babbitt administration. But it's really underused. But Yuma County, um, I keep trying to get everybody to use it because it's it's your money. Thank you, Bobby. And she's absolutely right. And I and I will say I really do speak for Extension, Dia Debunker, uh, Robert, all of us. Our job is to serve you and, and do whatever. I mean, it's your field. It's your money. It's your crop. Uh, we want to help you do that. And so we designed this program very much with the farmer and the private sector in mind. I don't want to tell you what to grow because it's your money. I just want to find a way that we can surround you with research and surround you with the support you need to make you more productive. And so we fought very hard to keep that in the legislation and keep that in the program. Robert, anything else? Thank you. I'd just like to reiterate that we are here to serve you. I served five years in the Navy, seven years at the USDA as a technician, and now I'm serving you in this position as well. So thank you for allowing me to serve you. Let's give Robert another hand. We really appreciate you all taking the time today. I know you have busy schedules. Um, it's an important topic, and um, this won't be the last that you hear from us on this topic. Stay tuned for more Desert Ag Soil Health Initiative progress. Um, of course, thanks Joey and Ethan, great collaborators, great co-hosts. Um, our Waisita team, um, Sonnet Nelson, just made everything work. Our timekeeper, Jasmine, uh, Andrea, Rosa, Michelle was here earlier. Um, we're gonna send a survey out, so please um, complete the survey. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>